Okay, so yesterday we looked at the vector equation of lines, but now let's look at vector equations of other curves. So first of all, our circle in two dimensions. This looks very similar to something we've seen. Uh, that being complex numbers, you recall. So it's the same sort of idea. Magnitude, but now it's a vector. V minus V naught is equal to some constant number. I conveniently called it R for radius. We have indeed got a circle. So there's your vector equation of a circle. It would have center V naught, radius R. Just to prove it, there it is, but I've broken up the vectors into components. So it would be X minus X naught in the I direction, Y minus Y naught in the J direction. The magnitude of that, well, if I square both sides, so it gets rid of the square root sign on the left-hand side, you'll see we get what we recognize to be the Cartesian equation of a, of a circle. We also know that cos squared plus sine squared is one. R squared cos squared plus R squared sine squared is R squared. Why have I done that? Well, if I let x minus x naught be R cos theta, y minus y naught be R sine theta, I end up with the parametric equation of a circle, but in vector form there. So basically, you may recall we've seen the parameters of R cos theta, R sine theta, but that was usually when the center was at the origin. All we've got there is a, a shift happening, the center's been moved to x naught, y naught. All right, so let's show that this dot product actually represents a circle, All right? Dot products, we'll notice both vectors are the same. So that's the same as the magnitude of the vector squared. So we have r minus 2i plus 3j, there's the magnitude. So the center, I don't have to bother to work it out into Cartesian form, because it's now in that form of the modulus of a vector minus the center is equal to the radius. What may be throwing you there is we called the vector r in this case, and so you keep thinking r radius, but that r is not representing the radius, it's just representing a vector. Vector equation of the tangent to this circle at the point three, four. I'm gonna draw myself up a diagram to get a feel for what's happening here. So there's our circle. We want the equation of that blue line there, the vector equation of it. So R is some random point on that uh, vector. So I know PR would be head minus tail, R minus three I minus four J. I've drawn in radius OP, which would be three I minus four J. And the other thing you may recall, radius is perpendicular to the tangent. So I know the dot product of those two vectors are zero. Now, it's a different way of writing the equation of a line, but that is an equation of a line. Now, if you want to expand the whole thing out, you can prove it. But there is the equation of the line. The dot product of those two things equal zero. It's just that I haven't made other subject. Normally you would see it as other subject. Now, let's actually prove that is a line. We're gonna find the Cartesian equation of the tangent. In the first one, I've uh, broken it out into its components. So x minus three in the i direction, uh, y minus four in the j direction. We'll do our dot product. So we get three lots of x minus three plus four, y minus four. And so we'll get 3x minus 9 uh, plus 4y minus 16. And so we end up with 3x minus 4y minus 25 equals 0. Circle, of course, is two dimensions. Let's go have a look at three dimensions. What is the equation of a sphere? It's exactly the same thing. But now we're in three dimensions. So it's the vector minus the center is equal to some radius, so magnitude of that is equal to some radius, that'll be the equation of a sphere. The center's the same, radius. Okay, break that into component form. We now just have three components. So we also have a Z minus Z naught K. And in Cartesian form, we'd end up with that lovely expression, X minus X naught squared plus Y minus Y naught squared plus Z minus Z naught squared is equal to the radius squared. That would end up being the parametric form of a, of a sphere. Uh, now here with this one, you'll notice we have uh, two angles for the sphere. Again, don't panic yourself about that one. It's not something we have to know, but just for the sake of completeness, there it is. Yeah. We've got two spheres. They intersect at a circle. 
So if you think you're getting two spheres and what overlapping each other, that point of intersection or that shape you get on the intersection would end up being a circle. Upon which plane does the circle lie? Okay, well, let's solve them simultaneously. You notice the nice numbers that have been chosen for this. So, oh, look. I can eliminate the x plus 2 squared straight away, the y plus 3 squared straight away, and I just get z plus 2 squared minus z minus 4 squared equals 9. z equals 7 on 4. That is the equation of a plane. Remember, what we, in two dimensions, we think of as an equation of a line. In three dimensions, it's an equation of a plane. That's why the Cartesian equation of a line in three dimensions looks funny, because you've got the equals equals one. So when it's just pronumerals equaling, or, well, pronumerals to the power of one, I should say, all equaling something, that's going to represent a plane. So the two spheres intersect on the plane, z equals seven on four. So what is the center and radius of that uh, intersecting circle? Well, I now know z is always seven on four for that shape. So I can sub that in and I'll end up with a Cartesian equation for a circle. And there it is. So the center ends up being minus two, minus three, but don't forget the Z value, which would be seven on four because it's on the plane, seven on four. And the radius, five root seven on four units. Find the intersection points of the sphere and this line. If they intersect, I'll sub that in for R, and the magnitude of that wonderful expression there is equal to four. Tidying it up, make it look a bit neater there. So I've got it in its three components, squaring both sides as well. So we get lambda squared plus four plus nine minus 12 lambda plus four lambda squared is 16. Lovely little quadratic to solve. Unfortunately, it's not a nice neat number. So we get lambda is 6 plus or minus the square root of 51 on 5. Well, we know what lambda is now. So therefore, x is equal to 1 plus that wonderful expression of 6 plus or minus root 5. Uh, y is 2. That was nice. And z, 3 minus that lovely little expression there. Because it lies on the line i plus 2j plus 3k plus lambda, da, da 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 I sub that in for lambda, and I will get the, the points. So therefore, there's our points of intersection. V is the position vector of a point P. It's on a sphere S, center C, radius R. So in other words, the equation of the sphere is the magnitude of V minus C is equal to R. Where C is the vector OC, do not prove this. Okay, so in other words, this is all information that we, we know. Part A, strap yourselves in. The equation of the line L through the point P in the direction of the vector M would end up being W plus V plus lambda M. So all they're really saying is we've got a vector, it goes through uh, V, its direction vector is M. That's all it's really saying. Find the values of lambda that correspond to the intersection of the line L and the sphere S in giving your answers in terms of V, C, and M. Now, this question uh, it came from, well, Nessa, prior to the first, so the HSC hadn't been sat last year, and they just threw together, oh, here's some sample questions. And this was one of them, and everyone's looking at it and going, what the, what the hell are they talking about? So we thought, well, it's kind of important we have a look at this one and see if we can't get our heads around it. They didn't give a diagram. This is all they gave. So I found a diagram would be more useful, though. So let's try and put it together with the diagram now. So there's my sphere. The centre is at C. The radius is R. Now, what have they told us? Let's go back again. V is the position vector of a point P. So I've labelled one of the points of intersection of that vector and the sphere P. And noted in parentheses there, okay, that one's our vector V. Um, with centre C, yep, we've done that, radius R. Now, W is the equation of a line through P. So W is just some random point 
on the vector. It's the equation of any point on the line. I've chosen to be the other point of intersection. So I'm saying, okay, W there is that other point of intersection. Now, find the values of lambda that correspond to the intersection. So these two points. So what do we know? We know that that vector there, the length of the vector W minus C would also be the radius. So we know that to be true. So if I substitute in V for W, because V lies on the line, it is one of the points of intersection as well. So if I substitute that in, that must be true. V plus lambda M minus C is equal to the radius. Well, if I square both sides, but of course when I square the magnitude, I get the dot product. Remember the dot product of u dot u is the magnitude of u squared. So I now I've got that, which allows me to expand out. So we will get v minus c dot v minus c plus twice lambda v minus c dot m plus lambda squared m dot m is equal to the radius squared. Let's get that back into some magnitudes, things like that. So v minus c dot v minus c is the magnitude of v minus c squared. And at the other end, the m dot m is the magnitude of m squared. Well, hang on, v minus c, that's equal to the radius squared. Okay, well, that means I've got some r squareds that'll cancel there. So I now have this expression. Remember, we're trying to make, what's it, lambda? We're trying to find values of lambda. I could factorize that lambda. Hang on, it equals zero. Rules of algebra haven't changed. If I've got two things multiplied together to give zero, one of them must be zero. So either lambda is equal to zero, or the expression that they're looking for, lambda is equal to 2m dot c minus v over the magnitude of m squared, which satisfies what the question asked, because it said, find lambda in terms of m, c, and v. And I've done that. Yeah, it's horrible, but I've got the answer that they've asked for. What of course makes it uh, a little bit harder is they haven't given you a clue. It's not, they haven't said, show that it's this. So you don't know where you're heading to. So I can imagine had they actually put that in a paper, people would get to that point and still feel like there's more to do. But as I say, it does actually satisfy the requirements of the question. Oh, we kept going the question, by the way. Now deduce that the line L is a tangent to the sphere if and only if m dot v minus c is equal to zero, and then go and interpret what that actually means. Well, if L is a tangent, then there is only one point of intersection. In other words, my vector w and my vector v must be the same thing. Therefore, v plus lambda m must equal v, lambda equals zero. So now I go back to my answer before and say, well, okay, let's make lambda equal zero. Well, the first one's trivial, because lambda's always equal to zero, so that's fine. But now let's have a look at the right-hand side there. Uh, 2m dot c minus v. Now, that must be true. m dot v minus c equals zero. Because uh, the top of the fraction must equal zero. I don't have to worry about the two. So it must be the m dot v minus c that's equal to zero. What does it mean? It means exactly what we know in two dimensions is true in three dimensions as well. Because if the dot product's equal to zero, then they must be perpendicular to each other. So the radius is still perpendicular to the tangent, even in three dimensions. From this point on, not in the syllabus, okay? I just thought it'd be nice to show you how interesting this can get. So don't panic, because I know some of you will. You're looking to go, oh my God, don't panic. But here, here's some other graphs in 3D. Well, a plane, let me take it back. Fair enough, a plane. And that's what I was talking about. If you've got, for want of a better word, a linear equation, right, equals a constant number, you'll get a plane. A hemisphere, it's, uh, it's very similar to the semicircle formula, you'll notice. Makes sense, puts the semicircle through to three dimensions. So you have one of the pronumerals equaling the square root of r squared minus the other pronumeral squared. A paraboloid. So instead of having, uh, well, y equals x squared, so one pronumeral equals the other one squared, you've got one pronumeral with the other two squared added together. And the opening, you'll notice, in this one is in the z direction, and that's because z's to the power of one. 
So if you had x equals uh, y squared plus z squared, it would open in the x direction and, and so on. There's a cone. It ends up being z equals a times the square root of x squared plus y squared. Again, because z's the subject, that one opens in the z direction. A hyperboloid, but you can get different hyperboloids. This one's got, is what we call a hyperboloid of one sheet. So it's just one surface. And the reason it's one surface is because only one of the squares is negative. If two of the squares are negative, we end up with a hyperboloid of two sheets. So it's sort of like the, the other one. And then here's a really cool one. I've got it in parametric form. You actually end up with the helix or a spiral for that one. T, of course, is the parameter. As I say, not actually in our course, because remember, this course is not a course on three-dimensional coordinate geometry. This is vectors we're looking at. So this is really beyond what we're looking at in the order. Okay.